So that makes me a start. Sorry to slightly late um, start the meeting. Just sorting out a few uh, IT challenges. I think we're okay. Okay, so um, I've got a number of apologies which I'll, I'll announce in a second, but let's just do item one. Uh, declaration of interest. Do you any members wish to declare interest soon? Um, I declare that I'm a partner. Yes, I'm a council appointed governor to CWA. Okay. Anyone for anyone? No? Okay, great. So apologies for absence. We've got a number. Paul Boyce, Sheena Kaminsky, Karen Hal, Brian Simpson, Booster. Anybody else? Oh, Karen Pryor. Karen Pryor. Okay. Right, so I'll, I'll send around the attendance sheet if I may. Great. Okay, let, let's just have a, a quick look at the minutes um, from last time, item three. Um, and I'm asking whether we can approve the accuracy of those minutes. I assume that you've had a chance to read them. Are you happy with them? Agreed? Okay, um, <clears throat> item four, because Karen Pryor is unable to attend, she was going to present the Health Watch rule report. So can I suggest we defer that to our next meeting? Hopefully Karen can get in. Okay. Can I just yeah. um, circulate the report? You circulated the report, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's a written report that's going to be done. But let's, let's ask Karen to hopefully be able to attend the next meeting to present it. So that takes us uh, on then to uh, item five, um, and uh, not really the right category for children and young people, but we've got the next item is the Merseyside Safeguarding Adults for the Annual Report. And Sue, Sue Redmond, who's the independent chair, it's kindly come on for this, and thank you very much for your attendance. And I think you're going to take us through the report. Yes, very good. Yeah. That's okay? Yeah, and of course, okay. they all start as children, so it's it is. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. And um, I'm the chair, I keep calling it the new, fairly new, combined um, across the boroughs, adult safe garden board. And two years ago, April 17, um, April 17, yeah, we set up the new Merseyside adult safe garden board, um, bringing the four boards, the existing four boards that you all be used to have a presentation to together. And the whole aim is of all partners to bring it together. And it was a fairly radical adventure, really, and um, decision. Uh, it was about joint learning, value for money, um, better use of resources, um, sharing good practice, challenging each other, joint training, a whole range of things. Um, and I think what I'm presenting to you now is the first form, that's a form, first formal presentation of the first annual report. So it's a bit out of date, so I can update you at the end where, we, where we've come to now. And you're my second um, board that I've been to. Uh, I'm doing the rounds of the four. And certainly, um, it's the sunniest. Yes, <laughs> always um, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I don't, I'll, I'll just, I won't go through all these slides. Um, the membership you'll have, I hope you've seen the annual report, you've got the details in your back. So uh, the membership is um, this huge commitment from all partners and at the most senior level and everyone comes to the board, so that's really positive. Um, the way the board works, the way most boards work, is we have um, the actual formal board, but then the real engine of the board is the subgroups. So we have five, one, two, three, four, five, six subgroups, I have to check. And those subgroups are fairly self-explanatory. But the thing I just wanted to highlight is that each of those subgroups are chaired by a senior manager. Um, the first one, the safeguarding adults, is chaired by the police. The second one is chaired by fire and rescue. The third and fourth are chaired by senior management local authorities, different local authorities. And, and the, the fifth and sixth are, are chaired by the senior manager and the CCG. So we've got a real um, collaboration of um, everyone getting involved. So that's really positive. Um, safeguarding boards, as you know, um, present millions of data and um, statistics. And this report this time has got very few in. One of the reasons for that is each council area collected data in a different way. They work in a different way. So when we put the data together, the comparisons 
a bit scary, but I'll explain how they what they mean when you look at when you look at them. I'm pressing it. <laughs> That's just giving you the population um, statistics at over 65 and over 85. The next slide and the one after show how, what we record in adult safe colleagues the number of concerns people have had about people in the borough. And they, put, they report the concerns um, into the local council. And these show the, the concerns in each council area. And I suppose the thing that's quite stark is the, it shows Wirral has by far. Um, the most concerns and the most people who've raised concerns. So when we all looked at that, we're all thinking, oh wow, what does that mean? And no have got the least, what does that mean? How, what are we comparing here? Are we looking like with like? Does it mean that no is safer and we're also more, more um, risky? What does it mean? So what that led us to do, which is the whole purpose of the Adult Safe Golding Board, is to go behind the statistics. And what we found from going behind those statistics was it's not about people being less safe here, it's about how um, the front door works, how the referrals come in, how they're triaged, what they come into. Different councillors do it different ways. What that led, led, us, led us to then, which is a really positive aspect of coming together before um, areas, is to look at what it actually meant for the frontline staff who were doing that work. Was there a better way of working for each of us? Was there a good practice model? So um, one of the things before, uh, that the coming together for areas really wanted to do was get frontline staff together. So we got frontline staff from each of those areas who do the front door, and we got them on um, a project to go around to all the other areas and look at what happens. And out of that work, they found it fascinating, and they really did collaborate. Out of that work, they came up with what would be the best practice model in the future. No, uh, no area has it perfectly right. So it, br it brought together the good issues from all the areas. And out of that, we developed a good practice model. Um, the next slide is just a similar one to show how many concerns. The good practice model um, is now being taken forward by all councils, and certainly Wirral has really embraced um, a triage model, a different way of working in the front door. I'm sure Graham might want to say more. But a different way of working to take the huge pressure there was on that safeguarding team and disperse at, at the first point of call. Um, you're training up your contact, your call centre staff more, you're doing a lot more social workers in the team, there's a lot more happening. And what we've seen in the second year stats, which are not <coughs> available formally yet, is those figures have come down because it's being triaged and they're going to the right people. The importance of that, of course, is you only want your safeguarding uh, team to get those inquiries that are really relevant to them. Uh, and you want other people who perhaps have other concerns to be um, sent to the right place straight away. So, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a really important model. That's the only one statistic which, which we're looking at. But out of that was a whole piece of work, which I, I keep wanting to reinforce the collaborative work of the, the board coming together about how we can all learn. And we're also being very open, as have others, to taking those lessons on. The next slide is what happen, we all show in every um, safeguarding adults, is where um, the most prevalent abuse, types of abuse, and um, what are the most prevalent. And it's neglect, physical and financial and psychological, as you might understand. What we have to do, again, is go beyond those data and look at what do we mean by neglect. Neglect can be anything from um, a mistake in a go-home around the medication to someone really not getting the services that they need. So although these figures are presented every year on year to, um, to adult safeguard and board, what we've been doing in our board is trying to get behind these stats. So it's a huge, uh, one of the subgroups is looking at what neglect means, uh, what it means in detail, what it, is in different themes, in different areas. It's mostly around self-neglect of people themselves and care home issues. Now care home issues aren't always about safeguarding, they're often about commissioning and um, quality. So the links in Wirral and the links in other councils, we've been asking what are the links between your quality assurance team and your safeguarding team, and the links are very um, close now because you combined a lot more as well. Um, so we're assured, we're getting more assured, but there's a lot more work to do be done behind um, these data. Financial abuse is coming more to the fore, that's a growing theme. 
and we're going to have a work stream looking at that um, this year. Where did safeguarding incidents, uh, where are they reported? Most, most of them are in people's own homes or in residential or nursing care, as you might understand. And then when we look at who are the alleged perpetrators of the abuse and were they known to the person. Most people um, were known to the person they were alleged to have abused. Um, and what that does, again, we just report on these data year after year, what we're now looking at is if it's in a person's own home, and they know the person, is that a paid carer, is that a, a family member? We are now coming out with those statistics this year and we're, we're looking at where is a family member? If they are a paid, if they are a carer, what are we doing in each authority around the carer strategy? How are we supporting our carers? What are we doing to prevent this sort of um, incidence in the future? Some of it's about stress, some of it is about uh, criminal behaviour, but we are really getting to understand the figures so we know them more. The reason I'm, I'm just saying this now is because these figures on their own don't tell us anything, so that's why we need to do a lot more, I mean, we're needing to ask a lot more um, questions about the data. In terms of how the risk managed, this is showing that when people um, are at risk of abuse, um, the whole purpose of it is to try and mitigate that risk, or to take out the risk. In some instances, as you'll see, the risk remains. But even where the risk is mitigated or taken out, it's very interesting conversations we have with people who use services themselves and what that means to them. We can take risks away from people, but they have a choice. Many people have a choice, and we take risks away from people, and sometimes by taking risks away from people, we don't improve their quality of life. We can might actually restrict their quality of life. So what we're looking at now is, yes, this is a statistic that possibly looks good, but what does it actually mean? And we have the most amazing presentation. One of the principles in the, in the board is we have a presentation or a story from someone who's been in the system each board meeting. And we have a choir, um, a signing choir, people learning disabilities who came. And they did the most amazing presentation. In that presentation, they, they showed us um, a slide. And the first slide had a person walking in, in the desert, um, in the middle of nowhere, by themselves. And they said, now that's a vulnerable person. And then the next slide, they showed a tank in the, in the desert. And they said, now you don't think that tank's um, vulnerable, do you? The way I have, I could be a tank if I have friends, if I can go to places I want to, if you don't keep closing um, places I like to go to, if you support me to live my life, that could be my tank. You need to help me with my tank rather than taking my tank away from me. And that was quite powerful in terms of what can we do to mitigate risk in a way that really improves people's quality of life as well? So there's a lot more to be done behind the scenes on the things that we're doing at the moment. Um, as I said, at the beginning of each um, meeting, we have um, someone telling us their story, and we have the most powerful stories, and we have, we've had also serious adult reviews, where people have either been seriously abused or actually died as a result of some sort of abuse. And of those um, discussions, they hit home very powerfully the purpose of the board. And one of the things we have to do is listen to people who use services and listen to frontline staff to try and help people learn and help them improve what's, what's happening. And the last board meeting, for instance, was in uh, Liverpool Prison. And we had a speaker, we, we had a bloke who'd been an ex prisoner. He'd been in prison, and that was for 10 years, and he'd been in various prisons. And, um, being under the children's agenda, of course, he talked about his life in the age of two, and we won't be surprised to know um, it was well signposted from a very early age what would happen to him. And one of the things for us in the adults board is one of our big roles in prevention. And I think one of our key roles in prevention is to really understanding what's happening much earlier and helping and working together with children boards and children's services on helping that whole life journey. So that's one of the things we're looking at this year. Um, we've got a, a work stream that is looking at um, ACEs. I always forget what that stands for. Adverse. Thank you. <laughs> Adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. Um, with the police probation and um, community rehabilitation services to look at how we can, we can work with them together on that. Um, we've achieved, I think, just in the first year, these are the first year, I won't go through them all, um, but just a couple of specifics. <coughs> One is we held um, a self-neglect workshop. Now, we did a lot more than that. We held three self-neglect workshops. There was a fire, you might remember, a fire in Mother Avenue in Liverpool. 
uh, two older people, they hoarded um, and the, the whole house was destroyed. The fire and rescue really wanted, it was the first meeting of the board and the fire and rescue brought uh, their story um, to our board. And although it wasn't considered to be something we could look at formally through a serious adult review at that stage, and the board was so concerned by the lack of power the fire service felt, everyone else felt they couldn't do anything about this couple, they tried but they couldn't help them, that we set up a work stream. And that work stream then got um, frontline staff from every agency, every agency across the four areas, um, with John Law's University. And we did a, a, a set of three workshops, listening to them about working with people who've got very um, very complex lives and when they can't actually, they don't um, come to us and they don't want to hear what we're doing, they won't listen in the door, how frontline staff feel and I went to um, two of out of the three and the frontline staff were all saying how it impacts their everyday life knowing that they can't do something with this, this particular family. One woman was talking about a bloke was going to come out of prison, he was going to be homeless, he wasn't going to accept any um, help. And his, her manager was telling her, you can't do any more, close the case. Just close the case and move on. And she just, all she felt was, he's coming out of the weekend, what can I do? And other members around the table were also saying this. And what came out of that was some guidance that they were saying would work. Frontline staff were saying, maybe this could help, or this could help. One person, maybe a nurse could visit someone who didn't want to see a police or a social worker. Maybe there's different ways of working. That guidance then was taken to a group of people who are... They, they self-identify um, as, they hoard and they self-neglect. And they came together and they looked at that guidance and they looked at it and they've amended it. So now we've got a help and got helpful guidance for frontline staff, which says, in this instance, there may not be anything really you can do, but try this or try this or try this. And at the end of that, you know you've done everything. It also is challenging managers in every service to say, one of the things you can't do is close cases. You might have to leave some more cases open. You might have to stay in contact with that person, whether they want you or not, um, just to be there. So um, I think that's quite an achievement um, myself, because um, that's actually about taking something we had in the board and delivering something from it. I mentioned the front door. We did the front door review. That is now um, working with all the um, local authorities looking at the front door. We're working with the, um, other partners as well to over hopefully come to one referral form for people and putting in concerns, so you don't have to have a multitude of uh, referral forms. But particularly the police and fire, they are really um, are pleased about that. Um, just in terms of the future, you can't read that, but in terms of the coming year, we've got some clear priorities, and they are, we need to hear the voice of the service user and the frontline staff. We want to get on top of that performance data to really understand it. We want to work more widely with children's boards and others. And we want to get our governance right so we make sure our subgroups and everything's working really well and we're not duplicating across our areas. Um, there's some of that still going on, but we're, we're trying to work on that. We had a development day only two weeks ago, so to update you really where we are, we've agree, um, agreed the subgroups now, which are chaired by senior managers, they've got participation <coughs> from everybody. Uh, we've agreed their clear priorities and what they're going to be doing. We've agreed that all board members, because they need to be rooted in reality, um, all board members have been given, um, and Graham, don't know you're at the, uh, the last one, but uh, we've given you um, an organisation to visit. We're all, we've all been given, uh, we've all had to dip into a hat, and we've given a random um, choice of an organisation to go and visit who know we're coming. Not to do a safeguarding audit, but to see how it is for the frontline staff. And we're just going to bring that back to board just to inform our practice. Um, we've got a service user conference, we've got a big project with Health Watch. All the four Health Watches are working really well together for this board. And we've got a project where we're speaking to um, about 60 people in each local authority area who've been, in the, who've been in the system, who've been through safeguarding. How was it for you? What would be better? And we're going to have a conference with them in June. And we've also done what I think is very, very important and, and very, uh, really serious. It's a Chapter 14 board. Chapter 14 is the Care Act, the safeguarding chapter on, on the, um, in the Care Act. And the, one of the, the board has to be assured that every organisation around this table and around the board table has got everything, um, all the policies and procedures, all the culture is um, up to the standard we want. 
So we've done an audit and we've written to every organisation on the board. They've had to fill in a template. They've had to provide evidence. They've had to score themselves against about 14, 20 questions on one to three where they think they stand, three being really good. And we have gathered the evidence in. Each, each organisation has different people peer reviewing that evidence to see whether they agree with the rating. Sometimes we agree, sometimes it hasn't been agreed. Where it's not agreed, we are having what we're calling accountability meetings. So we're calling organisations in to meet that group of peers and telling them what their improvement plan is. We're repeating the audit this year and next year, and we aim to have every organisation at three, i.e. the board is assured, and we have the evidence in one place for everybody, that you are all doing what you should be doing in terms of safeguarding. So that's a thing we're doing. In terms of world, we've got great commitment, and um, we've got Graham who 